leading crowdsourcing practitioners share their tales, trials, and triumphs. This is Loud About Crowdsourcing. Welcome back to Loud About Crowdsourcing. This is Will Price. I'm joined once again by Nick Castillo and Clinton Bonner. Hey, guys. What's going hey. on? Hey, Will. But no one cares. No one cares about Quentin and Nick. You guys are used to hearing them. We have not just (laughs) one guest. We have two guests for you today. So uh, I'm very happy to welcome uh, Ryan Levier, coming from GE Transportation, a global design manager. Hey, Ryan. Thanks for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me, y'all. And we're also joined by Adam Moorhead, the... uh, Adam, I don't even know what your title is at Top Coder. I feel like it changes all the time, but it's uh, design related. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah, no, so global, g- global creative director at Top Coder. Oh, that was my guess, too. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Will. We should know these things. Come on. I know, I know. Not not super prepared. But uh, so Ryan and Adam have joined us today because uh, they're going to share a bit of a story later in our episode about uh, the Top Coder Open in 2016. Uh, there was a really cool experience there uh, in the design space that I've been calling competitive collaboration, which doesn't sound like it makes any sense whatsoever, but they're going to tell you a little bit more about that uh, later in the episode. But first, uh, I would like to continue with our tradition that we have on Loud About Crowdsourcing, where uh, we ask all of our guests to share their first crowdsourcing experience. You know, what was uh, the experience where you said, like, hey, this is this is it. This is the way of the future, and this is the way I want to work. So I'm going to throw it to you, Ryan. Uh, do you have a, a cool story where crowdsourcing got its hooks into you? Yeah, you know, we just first started this last year. And uh, we really didn't know what to expect. Um, we, we knew we had kind of a gnarly challenge um, on our hands. We didn't have the resources um, necessarily available at the time because we were just building a team within, within design and GE. Um, so we, you know, we got hooked up with Adam and uh, started looking at some of the different approaches that they've used in the past. And you know, Adam and I got to talking, and, and coming from a design background, um, I kind of wanted to run it in a certain way and make sure that we could iterate with the designers and um, you know, we're user experience designers, so for us, it was about informing these global designers from around the world um, and have them iterate through informed design based on our expertise. Um, so, you know, when we first did the, the first design challenge uh, through a weekend, we came back and the output was incredible. I remember um, flying to Chicago, being with um, my broader team. Um, and we printed out all the, all the outputs um, from the competitors and put it all up on a wall. We've got this great picture. And, and I just remember our um, chief technology officer walking by and seeing us synthesize all the, all the outputs to provide creative feedback for the next iteration. And, and he came in and walked in and just saw what we were doing it was, and was astonished at it. And, you know, I think he was hooked there. And he actually came to the Top Coder Open in Washington, D.C. this past year as well. Um, so he's a huge supporter, and, and I think that first initial experience and him seeing that has helped us ingrain crowdsourcing into our um, innovation design thinking process within the company. So it was it was a great experience. Hey, hey Ryan, real, Ryan, I wanted, I wanted to ask real quick too. Uh, it's I've heard some other folks talk about like taking like you know taking outputs and like getting them up on the wall there. Like, how, can you can you give some uh, some indication as to like. Do, did you guys are always think we want to get these things up on a wall and start like drawing and circling on them so it's, it made it more like collaborative and white whiteboardy, or was it kind of like a, hey let's put these up there and then what did that do like once you had once you took them out of like okay they're sitting in a computer and you put them up you know on a board somewhere what that do to the room what that do to like just just the, the feel the energy like it's always good to share that kind of stuff because I think folks think about just crowdsourcing in general, I don't care what platform you're on, and you think about it being sometimes distant and cold, and I think a method yeah. like that helps make it more like, well, this is how we work anyway, or this is a cool way to work. It'd be, be neat to understand like the process behind uh, you know, taking it off the computer files and, and getting it you know, getting it on the wall there. Was that just your brainchild or something you guys always do anyway? Yeah, I think you kind of nailed it. It's something that we always do anyway, so I'll definitely provide some color around that. Um, you know, we, we have a design thinking process and user-centered design here at G Transportation. And um, when we do these workshops with our customers, this is, we, everything is very low fidelity. We get, we get things up on the wall. Um, we tell stories around them. We have voting um, exercises where we'll focus on, you know, if it's a geographic track abstraction or whatever the design element is, um, we'll have voting and discussions around that, have sticky notes up. Um, and it's a way to kind of quantitatively and qualitatively 
um, figure out the direction so we can start converging all of those different ideas that we've gotten from around the globe. We can kind of start converging them into a single path for the next iteration. Um, so we all get up in a room. There's probably, you know, five to ten of us from different experiences in design and and uh, we kind of explain what the what the challenge is. We bring a couple outsiders in. So typically we have four or five designers and then a couple of people that don't have any design background just to get an outside perspective. And, you know, we'll have voting dots where we have everything printed out from each of the um, we actually create a matrix. So you we have a. Uh, um, for the for the columns, it's the different types of design. So whether it's geography or um, icons or whatever the design omelets are, different types of pages. And then we have all the submissions as the rows. Um, so we organize it in that way, um, and that helps us kind of kind of look at it strategically. And then we just go and start voting on it with dots, and then we capture it, start converging, start Frankensteining. We actually I, I don't know if. Um, Adam has shown you all this, but we take all the best ideas and we, we recapture that digitally and start providing feedback. And we actually put a Frankenstein, you know, screen together based on all the best ideas that we had. And we share that back to the, to the crowd and they're able to see other designers ideas and it helps them iterate in a, for me, a more comprehensive way. And, and it just gets exponentially better from that. So yeah, it's a process we already use. We call it co-creation. Um, within GE Transportation, it's how we bring our customers into workshops, and we basically just do a lot of low fidelity exercises like that to help drive, you know, innovation and create these leaps, and we, we like to call them leaps in design. So, that's great. That's re really cool color. Thanks. Thanks, Ryan. Now, our next crowdsourcing story comes from one of the I feel like one of the godfathers of crowdsourcing design, uh, Adam. I know I put you <laughs> your title earlier. But, uh, I know you've been at this for a long time, and you've done so much interesting work. Uh, over the years for a variety of customers. Uh, but what was, what was the first where you said, you know, crowdsourcing is the way forward for me? Yeah, well, so that's, that's it's, this kind of dates me, right? So, um, I mean, as you said, I've probably worked on every customer project that, that we've, um, that's come across. Uh, but back in 2006, when we started um, doing design at Top Coder, so really taking the Top Coder methodology, thought process, and applying it to design, um, I had I had that moment, kind of that epiphany, when we were working with one of our customers, and, and I had a tight deadline, and I put out a, a design challenge out to the community, um, really trying to figure out how this process is going to work, are we going to get the results? I had my own doubts, right? Um, and and will the community be able to react back to uh, to the to what I needed to to deliver for our customer? And um, I, I got a variety of designs back. Uh, some were along the lines of what I was looking for, others were not along the lines of what I was looking for, but the but the ability to tell the designers and, and, and guide them in a way that I knew that the customer would be interested and, and, and knowing what the customer wanted um, and, and to be able to get those results back. It ended up being like a three-day process. Um, it, that, was, that was the moment for me to realize that, hey, there, there's, a, there's a way that this can be used in a, in a way that can really help our customers and help the, the design process and, and really kind of educate designers around the world to, to understand um, what top coder customers are interested in. So it's, it dates me, but back in 2006. All right. Well, um, I guess we've, ha we've got our stories now, uh, but let's talk a bit more about GE. So Ryan, I know GE is doing a lot uh, to push crowdsourcing internally, and I know you work on, on an innovation team at GE. Can you share a little bit more about uh, the program that's being built there? Yeah, so, you know, it kind of all starts from we have a, you know, net new $100 million revenue challenge from our CEO and, and you know, she kind of reached out to our leaders and said, how do we go do this? And one of the, one of the ways is to do net new ideas, right? So we, we've put a platform in place where we do VC style funding. We need a ton of ideas coming into um, the platform. And then what we do is we basically bring in our customers um, and we say, hey, we have this. We, we know you have this problem. Let's help you work through this. Um, and then once we get through a problem space workshop, we take that and we inform from the customer and from the user what our design challenge is going to be, right? And then we ha we go to Top Coder. We uh, do this design challenge that we just talked about, and we bring it back and bring it back into another workshop with our customers and our users and synthesize everything and then push it back out to the crowd and continue to iterate that. That's something that we've infused into our entire portfolio of products and net new ideas. 
to try to meet a revenue challenge that our CEO is asking us to do. So um, I've basically every design team, every product team, if they want to get funding, they essentially have to go build out a proof of concept through this process um, to get additional funding to keep driving that idea forward. So it's been infused into our entire strategic management agenda. Um, we have a weekly call with our CEO or chief digital officer to show them all the net new ideas that we're generating from this process. Um, so it's something we've really ingrained um, in kind of into the culture of our of our company. So, um, you know, crowdsourcing is a great way to come at it from a global perspective. We're a global company with global software. And if we, you know, have, you know, United States designers that are only designing from our perspective, we're going to miss the boat from a competitive advantage per perspective. So. Hey, hey, Ryan, I have a quick, quick follow up for you there. So like uh, when <clears throat> it always seems when when large organizations uh, try to adopt and, you know, and, and try to just shift mentality and do, do new things, there's always going to be some uh, call it backlash, call it call it. Hey, that's not how we that's <laughs> not how we used to do things or, or hey, this is just different. Therefore, you know, therefore it's scary. Right. Some some uh, some log logic like that. Um, as your team's going through this as well. Are you seeing some of that too? And then what are some of the things that actually, you know, kind of blow past that, that they get past those hurdles? Uh, just for folks that might be out there that, that want to dip the toe and kind of start in crowdsourcing, but yeah. but are kind of already getting anxious and anticipating, well, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to feel this kind of this blowback and this kind of challenges. And I'm sure you went through some of that as a team. That'd be cool to share too about like, what would you feel? And then how'd you kind of get past that with some of these folks? Or... Did they just not join for the ride? Are they just sitting on the sidelines? What's what's the scoop there? Yeah, it's a mixed bag. I think you you know, kind of nailed it on the head again. Um, you know, from an adoption perspective, we do a lot of communication from the top down. So our senior executives believe in this and support it from the bottom up. My team goes and drives this um, process and adoption through our organization. There are still people today that just don't get it and will never get it. Um, one of the best ways for us to show them the power of it is to bring these cross-functional um, you know, team members, employees at GE Transportation into these design thinking workshops. So um, every, every two weeks we're holding these design workshops where we invite um, cross-functional people, put them into teams, run them through design exercises, um, show them the power of the crowd. So we, we show them how we'd go through that process for a long weekend or a week, um, how that gets pulled back into another workshop. And we're, and we're bringing them into that process, even if they're not aligned to that problem or that product. Um, and, and really, I've not. I've probably experienced one person um, in my history of running design workshops and um, user experience, you know, product product soft, uh, software development. And I've had one person not being being one involved in a workshop that wasn't, uh, you know, changed a changed person the way they want to go build software and the way what they want to ideate. So um, I think the key is to you know have communication from the top down, bottom up to, to evangelize, but to bring everyone into the process. It's not just for designers. Um, it's for everyone, so that's kind of how we come about it. And, yeah. and like you said, there's people that will, ne will still never get it and just won't even show up to a workshop, and we still get that. <laughs> and that's okay, you know. They, they they can stay on the sidelines, and everybody else will get on a different a different thing and just kind of blow past them, right? So that's exactly. Cool. So what's uh, I'll add something. What's really um, unique to Ryan's process right now is we are um, they've been very prescriptive in how they would like to use the community with their workshops so they have their workshop um, they synthesize and then they they provide the the details to the top cutter team uh, to essentially run the challenge and we run that uh, starting on a thursday uh, 5 p.m the challenge starts uh, the designers submit their initial designs by monday morning uh, the ge team whichever team is involved in that project provides um, feedback by end of day to those to the designers uh, and then the final results arrive on Thursday morning of that week. So Thursday to Thursday, um, and it fits into Ryan's um, process of, of workshops and working with their customers. Are you guys running one of these a week? Um, pretty much. We've run, um, over the last six weeks, we've run four. So, yeah. All right. So I want to move on and talk now about the Top Coder Open in 2016, which was held in Washington, D.C. this past year. Um, Ryan, Adam, you guys were both on site. Uh, Clinton and Nick were also there, as was I. Uh, so we all got to see this in action. So I think we can have a really cool round table about it. So from my perspective, I saw a bunch of designers come in, uh, some of the top, top coder designers from around the world. Uh, and I saw them gather together in a meeting room, whiteboard out with Ryan and Adam, uh, and really break things down, discuss it, and bounce ideas off one another. 
Then I saw them walk out of that room, walk to separate workstations, and compete against one another to realize the vision in the best way possible. Uh, they did this multiple times in multiple rounds until one person won the prize at the end, and the others, uh, the, the others, you know, got their trip, but they didn't win the big cash prize. But everyone was happy, and everyone was celebrating the victor. It was a really, really cool experience to watch that all happen. Uh, that was my perspective. In the room, I'm sure it was a, a different uh, and probably far more enlightening perspective on what happened. So, uh, Adam, Ryan, just take it away. Tell us about what you guys did and the experience that you had doing it. Well, um, let, me, let me start and just kind of set it up. So, the Top Critter Open, uh, every year we bring in our top designers and developers, right? So, this was our top 10 designers from around the world that have been competing all year. And we bring them on site and we compete on a customer's problem. Uh, this year, uh, I asked Ryan to join us and have a much more collaborative experience. Like, could we do a workshop? Could we use his techniques and what they're doing at GE Transportation and engage these 10 designers and really give them a better experience, but also have them understand uh, a true customer problem and, and on site be able to react to uh, Ryan and, and his team and the questions they might have, but also uh, be uh, collaborative in, in that process. So taking our traditional process, our traditional um, on-site where we run three hour, um, so essentially three rounds, three hours each, where the designers work for three hours and then we review and judge their, their designs. Um, we engaged Ryan's team and, and did this much more collaborative workshop, which you saw. Um, and, uh, and I thought it was a very, very cool, unique um, experience and the designers were very excited by it. They're still talking about it. Um, <laughs> But uh, I'll, I'll defer to Ryan. So, so based on kind of how we set that up, um, what was kind of your, your takeaway and, and, and the experience? Uh, you know, the, the word that comes to mind for me is just it's powerful. Um, you know, we have a great video that kind of tells the story as well. Um, you know, getting all these designers from around the world into a room together and sharing their designs. You know, anybody that's in design world or work in general, people are very protective. Um, of their you know own IP, and to have them come in and collaborate while they're competing is something that's I mean it was just so powerful to see and, and, and inspiring, um, and I think that's what openness and collaboration and crowdsources should be about right. It's to try to take a leap, and that's the way I try to you know challenge my designers is how do we take a leap to the future, um, and it's by you know pushing each other and sharing ideas and and uh, collaborating. Um, so for me, it was just, it was a great experience um, to see. And, and like Adam said, people are re still reaching out from that challenge um, directly and saying, how can we do this you know, better? And how can we use that type of framework and that approach? Um, so it was, it was just a great experience and great output. You know, I, just a little bit of the details, you know, we, the first day we really challenged them to say, hey, look, here's the problem. Here's kind of the variables at play. Um, we want you to really think outside the box. Like we push them to just go crazy with design and, and to see them struggle and come back together. And, you know, it was really interesting, Adam, I'm, I'm sure you know this, but, you know, they, were, they would go after the challenge all day working, you know, um, and after the feedback, they would go pair up and work together and just like kind of share their own thoughts of how they would come at these problems um, and come back and still compete together. I mean, that's that's, you know, that's some of the best type of competitive, you know, atmosphere that I've ever seen. And I've, I've had a lot of experience in, you know, competition. So it was, it was great. So a question for like Ryan or Adam, I'm sorry, I'm just going to jump in right here. Um, so what you, you had this big meeting, they're collaborating together. Like, how do you know you're going to get like different designs from each person? If, if it's kind of, it, it, is it, is it, are these meetings like, um, I guess I'm just curious if how you didn't get the same design actually um, from from multiple uh, members. Well, so the, yeah, totally. So the first day was all about setting up the challenge and you know saying let's here's the variables go take a leap. So when we had that that output after the first day, um, we did a lot of feedback and said you know this wouldn't work because of whatever reason. Your design wouldn't work because of whatever reason. I like this a lot. Um, it was very open, not super like trying to drive them in a certain way kind of feedback. Um, you know, I challenged them to individually continue their path for the most part, right? So it's like open feedback with everyone, but not trying to converge 
into a single design pattern. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's awesome. I, I, I like the idea. I like the way that, you know, by giving uh, not non-specific feedback kind of, um, you know, still pushes the ideas forward, um, even though like this feedback, you know, everyone is listening to it. And Adam, is that the way it would typically work in a typical challenge? Uh, no, no, this was different because because okay. of the open open collaboration, right? So in a typical challenge, we provide feedback, but it's much more siloed, right? It's it's uh, in this case, designers were able to see each other's designs. They were able to see feedback that we provided to one designer and different feedback we we provided to another designer. And they were able to um, think through that, like how they might apply that to what they're doing, right? Which is what was really cool and unique about this. Uh, in a traditional challenge, um, they, they don't have that, that ability to see each other's designs. Um, what we did see was by the end of the, by the, end of the, um, the competition over a couple of days and, a, and obviously a few rounds of, of iterations, was we did see that some designers started to take other ideas and bring it into their design, right? Because they saw Ryan and myself mentioning it or talking about it, or that was the, the natural progression of where this was going, right? But they still did their own twist on it, right? They, they knew it was still competition. They knew it still had to relate to their design and what they were proposing. So while they might have um, taken uh, some of the concepts in this open, open collaboration, it wasn't like they were just ripping each other off, right? It was very much like, hey, I know I'm still, I still have to sell this, so to speak, as part of my design and, and my story and my, my solution to, uh, to the GE team. So it just can't be this blatant like, oh, hey, I'm taking ideas and all this stuff and mashing up and hope I win, right? Mm -hmm. Awesome. How did, uh, did you get any feedback from these uh, competitors on that process? I mean, it sounds like everything went well, but it's obviously got to be a big shock to their system, uh, having competed year round <laughs> in one format and then turning around and suddenly seeing everyone else's work, getting everyone else's feedback. And I know a lot of these guys are friends, but I can imagine that when you've uh, you know got your way of doing things in a process that's established that you're used to working in, and it gets flipped upside down with a big prize on the, on the head, that there might be some resistance or some concern. Uh, did that ever come up, or were these guys just you know, ready to roll? Yeah, no, no. I mean, obviously, it was uh, majority of it was positive, right? But we also had some negative feedback around that, right? So they came in thinking that there would be a... Uh, um, a specific way that we would run the challenges, right? Now, we did run those challenges the same way we normally do. We just had this open collaboration piece around feedback, which, which we, we weighed it and said, hey, you know, the, the positive of this outweighs all the negatives, right? Get to work with a customer, customer engaged with the feedback, customer gets to meet you, you know, the designer, really get to know you, um, but also the, the, the ability for our designers to meet the GE team for, for even the stuff that's going on right now, right? So the ability of understanding who the customer is outside of uh, this competition really outweighed those negatives. So the negatives were mostly around, well, yeah, this is a little bit of surprise, or, hey, um, I don't necessarily know if I want to share my ideas, right? Um, so we had a couple um, that started out with that thought, but by the end of the competition, they came back to me and said, wait a second, you know, my upfront you know, hesitation, um, was, uh, you know, I've, I've overcome that because this has been such a great experience. So a, a quick follow-up on that too, has that experience, because we, we can't, uh, you know, always, obviously the Top Coder Open is a special a special environment. We can't always have people um, in a physical spot just, just, just because they're distributed across the globe. But has that experience, um, have you and Ryan talking about, about ways in which uh, the traditional competition process could become more like that and are there are there levers even though they might be virtual levers are there things that can move uh move a model more towards that and is is it you know a possible is it b uh you know a worthy endeavor have you guys gone down that path of thinking through uh you know how could we get it to be more like a physical environment although traditionally these contests are happening uh, virtually yeah i think uh adam if you don't mind i'll take a sure. stab at this one um, you know, I mentioned it a little bit at the beginning of the podcast is, um, you know, when we talk about synthesizing some of our, you know, when we go in, we, our team takes the outputs from the first iteration from, you know, the crowdsource, the, the virtual crowdsource exercise. Um, you know, we put together pointed feedback for each designer. So we actually go and take each of their designs and give them very specific feedback so that they can continue down their own path. But when I mentioned that we Frankenstein 
a design together, what we do is we take our favorite elements and we piece it together and we say, these are our favorite elements. And, it, and it's almost taken that same approach of here's some overall feedback and almost like here's a, a winner for specific little design features, right? For the first iteration. And it kind of gives them s- some, some, open collaboration and, and still competing together, right? So they're getting the point of feedback, they're getting their overall feedback, kind of like many winners halfway, and then they drive from that. So I think, I think we're starting to do that from that process. Um, Adam, what do you think? You know, I mean, obviously uh, on site, you and I, we had a lot of ideas, right? <laughs> it's like, how can we start integrating this? Um, I, uh, Clinton, to your point, I am working on, on, on a concept of could we fly a select group of designers on location with a customer and, and duplicate this, this process, right? Um, there's obviously a cost involved in that, but I definitely um, know that there are people that are interested um, in, in doing that. So it's something I definitely want to try or at least um, virtually try that where maybe um, our top designers similar to the top that are open are invited to, to join with a customer to engage on their problem. Yeah. Very cool. It's, I think that kind of like business model innovation on top of things that have been created already is, um, it's just fun. It's fun. It's fun to kind of watch and navigate and hear you guys go back and forth on how this came to be, I think is uh, really cool for the others to listen in and who are, like I said, starting out and being like, well, what, what can I possibly do? And when they realize that it's actually more malleable than they probably think it is, I think this helps them, uh, you know, helps them hopefully take that first step forward. And, and we, we like we are like we preach on this podcast, like we don't really care. Like do do something in crowdsourcing, get that first experience because you know you just got to get that hook into you and, and start to kind of get addicted to working that way because ah, because it becomes very it really becomes quite a, quite addictive. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know if you guys have experienced that, but when I was running lots of competitions to to fuel like my personal workload. Like if I wasn't running competitions, if I didn't have things running, I felt like sluggish. Even though I might be personally <laughs> productive, I didn't feel like I was like, wait a second, I was way more productive last week when I had three things going. So it kind of had that addictive nature where you want you wanted to run more stuff, and it's uh, it's always kind of fun to to kind of feed the beast, if you will. So no, just to your point, um, from our perspective, one of the great things is. Um, you know, we run these challenges from Thursday to Thursday, <clears throat> and a lot of times there's a time zone um, uh, where they're working eight hours ahead. So, you know, GE looks at this as not only are we getting this great output from around the world in a global perspective, but we're, we're essentially running a design factory 24-7. Um, so it's been really powerful for us to just, like you said, we're always working in some way because we have this machine kind of running. Uh, and yeah. It's been really powerful for us. Adam, so I know you'd mentioned, uh, you know, you're thinking about these opportunities where you can fly designers onto a customer's site and recreate this workshop experience. But um, it also sounds like there's a lot of really cool ideas coming out of the GE program. Things like, uh, you know, these mini winners and the Frankensteining. Is that something that you find is starting to influence how you're approaching these challenges going forward? Is that something that you're looking to maybe adopt in the future? Yes. So, so, so uh, I mentioned earlier how we've kind of worked into, we worked out a challenge process that fits into Ryan's uh, delivery model, right? The, the way he works with customers, workshops, right? So really, I want to move that towards our other customers, right? Like look at how this can be very, very, very prescriptive, fit into maybe your sprint, fit into the way you want to work with your customer, uh, and not make this be a, you know, a process that's, that's very outside or foreign to them, right? Um, so yeah, so a lot of what we're doing with GE Transportation is really um, making me think or update the way we do things to, to really kind of integrate this into to the enterprise more. Um, very, it's been very inspirational. Um, and, and just kind of the, the conversations that we have, um, especially at the end of these, these challenges with Ryan's design teams um, to, to really kind of see what's been working and what's not been working uh, has been very influential. Is there a particular moment that sticks out to you from the experience at, the, at TCO 16? Um, was there like a light bulb moment that happened in the collaboration room or did something happen during one of the competitive rounds where you saw someone just run away with things? Uh, for me, I, you know, at the very end, just seeing how excited the designers were, you know, outside of the great output and this process and the approach, like seeing them change uh, was probably the coolest 
thing for me. You know, like like you're talking about, it's really difficult for designers to share and be open in this way. And just watching their perspective change was, was huge. And that, you know, and to be able to drive that kind of change for designers, for the greater good of design, um, that was really cool for me. Yeah, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna mimic that. So, so the first thing that stands out is gonna be the the end where everyone was really really excited and happy for each other, and it was genuine. Like you could you could definitely tell that everyone was happy, even though, uh, wow, I'm not I'm not a winner, right? I did not win this, even though I, I worked with Ryan and team, and I felt like I was in a good spot. I, but I'm really excited for for the winner, right? I mean, you saw that, and it was raw, and it was very 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 cool. Um, the other thing for me was um, back to actually to Ryan's team. So as this was going on throughout the weekend, um, seeing uh, Ryan and the, uh, the couple of designers that he had with him on site kind of walking through and looking at the screens and talking and really kind of seeing, seeing the ideas that they, they were getting um, for me was, was, was very cool and really, really why I do this, really, really kind of this, to, see, um, to see our customers kind of really um, understand how this is uh, impacting their process. All right. Well, for all of our listeners, uh, I know you've heard a lot about what happened at TCO 16. You, there is an opportunity to see some of it. Um, so I know that there's a video out there. Uh, Clinton, do you know where that is? Oh, even better. Very cool. Yeah. So we know what happened. We definitely have it on several YouTube spots and, uh, and we'll definitely be also recapping all posts with, with a blog too. And so we could just kind of we could just embed that as well and put it below. So we'll, we'll have folks. Um, so if folks don't know topcoder topcoder.com slash blog. Uh, you can go there and get the, you know, get the kind of the, the 20 second snippet on all the episodes we're recording. There'll be the embed right there, a chance to subscribe, which of course we all want you to do subscribe, rate, give feedback. It all helps. And then in this particular case, we'll also link the, um, the GE transportation video from TCO 16. So folks can get a, Kind of get a get a glimpse of uh, of the, the really kind of get a feel because it's really a really well done video of what that room felt like and that and the that kind of energy that that Ryan was just describing as they were announcing the winners it's it's captured pretty well. Yeah, and then if you want less produced video content, there are also all of the video archives of the live broadcasts hosted by yours truly. <laughs> uh, we did we did show uh, a couple featured designers and their work in progress uh, on the on the live stream so you can actually see a little bit of how they're working uh, we talk about what the problem was they were working on you can check that out uh, i'm usually joined by uh, trevor garing one of our uh, design uh, architects at top coder uh, and he talks us through some of the design aspects that i am less knowledgeable about so there's uh, a lot of cool stuff there as well so that's all on the top coder youtube page and if I'm not mistaken, the uh, one of the competitors was the one that actually made the GE video at the competition. Not only did he make the GE video, but we <laughs> have actually hired. Um, oh wow! A competitor full time into GE, and he's going to be working remotely out of the Indonesian office. Just started three weeks ago. Met the Indonesian CEO. Um, he, he's doing a great job. So. You know, just to kind of put this into perspective for all the listeners and how powerful this has really been for our business is, you know, we started this a year ago, uh, Adam and I, and we went from, what, one or two challenges, maybe three last year, to every single one of my teams is starting to drive these. And there's there's been probably 10 or 15, I guess, since we started the year. Um, I mean, it's it's a that's a huge growth and us adopting that into our business. So... Uh, you know, if we're doing that GE transportation, it's something that needs to be done everywhere. So y'all are doing a great job. We appreciate that. But I think that was really directed at you, Adam. Nice work. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I think we're uh, we're coming up on our time. So I do want to note that with the exclusion of Ryan, who is from GE Transportation, all the rest of us work at Top Coder. So you're hearing a lot of Top Coder specific things. Uh, we would love for you to come crowdsource with us at Top Coder. If you would like to do so, please check out loudaboutcrowdsourcing.com or podcast.topcoder.com. If you don't want to or can't crowdsource with us, we encourage you to go check out any of the other vendors in the space and do what you can to create your own crowdsourcing story. Maybe you can join us someday and share it uh, once the hooks get into you. Uh, just get out there and crowdsource, no matter who you do it with or how you do it. That's what's most important. So we definitely encourage that. Um, Ryan, do you have a Twitter or anything where people can follow you? 
Man, I am uh, social media challenged. Unfortunately, <laughs> I do have a I do have an Instagram account. We have a GE Transportation Instagram account um, where we're documenting a lot of our workshops and processes and different challenges. Um, so I'd encourage you know everybody to kind of go look at what GE Transportation is doing. Um, and LinkedIn me if you have any questions and want to reach out for you know more in depth information about how we go do things. All right, Adam, do you have any social media presence you want to plug while you're here? Uh, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna plug the top critter social media. So I'm, in, I'm, I'm social media challenged also. <laughs> I think it's a designer thing. <laughs> Might be. All right, you can follow me at will underscore price and. Nick and Clinton can plug themselves. Follow me on Hokey Nick. No problem. And I'll, I'll, I'll plug myself at, at Clinton Bond, C-L-I-N-T-O-N-B-O-N. All right. And once again, if you would like to uh, subscribe to the podcast, you can get there uh, at loudaboutcrowdsourcing.com uh, or podcast.topcoder.com. We're available on Google Play, iTunes, and Stitcher. Please subscribe to us on those services, rate, and leave reviews. We'd love to hear your feedback. That was a great chat with Adam and Ryan. I'm really thrilled that they were able to join us. What'd you guys think? Oh, they were awesome. I think they there was a lot of insight into how they use crowdsourcing uh, specifically for design. I thought it was really cool. Yep, agree, full agree. Ryan's uh, Ryan's got something really special going over there with the team at GE. So it was very cool to hear him, hear him spell out exactly how they do what they do. It's uh, I, I hope the uh, listeners enjoyed as much as we did. Yeah, well, uh, he was a natural on this thing, so you guys better watch out for your chairs. I might pull him <laughs> in and get one of you guys to move. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> Wonderful. But that said, it is time for our cool crowd thing of the week, which still hasn't been named something better. If you have ideas for a better name for the cool crowd thing, please send it to us. I don't know, uh, man. I think at this point, it's just it just is what it is. It's, the, the, it's C- locked the in. CCT, baby. You know, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, and if we have any listeners out there, too, you know, if you want to write a jingle for that, that's cool, too. You know, we'll crowdsource the jingle for, for the cool crowdsourcing thing. That's a good idea. That's a good idea. Well, cool crowdsourcing thing. All right, never mind. <laughs> yeah, that one's taken. Don't, don't use that clip if you make something. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, this week's cool crowd thing comes by way of the New York Times. Uh, it was uh, in an article written by Nick Wingfield. Um, so it is, the article is titled, uh, Video Games Help Model brain, uh, Brain's Neurons. What? So, to summarize, um, I'm, I'm going to first apologize because I'm about to butcher a name, uh, so my apologies. But uh, the na- there's a, a man named Zoran Popovic, um, and he has worked on some video games in various roles. He's a computer science professor at the University of Washington, and uh, he is working alongside the Allen Institute yes. uh, for Brain Science. To, and he's launched this game, and it's called Mozak, which is... Um, it, it means brain essentially, uh, and in this game, the players uh, of which there are, at the time of publication there were about two hundred players. Uh, so it's a small crowd, but I'm sure after being featured in the New York Times Science section, that number probably increased. Mm-hmm. Uh, basically, what these players do is um, they trace out pictures of neurons taken by the Allen Institute for Brain Science. Uh, so they, they trace it out because their computer algorithms that would kind of map these things aren't where they uh, could be yet. They aren't as efficient as the human brain. And um, they earn points. They level up for doing it. There are leaderboards. They have a lot of gamification elements uh, wrapped around it. Uh, it's a really cool idea. And then what they're doing is they're taking these mapped out models and they're kind of averaging them out until they know, like they can say, you know, 100% like, okay, this image maps out this way. And then they can pump that back towards the algorithms and help the algorithms learn and become more efficient. Yeah. Uh, what did I miss guys? Well, I, very, so for, first things first, you know, we, we mentioned the, the Allen Institute, that is the Paul Allen Institute, the owner of the Seahawks. So we oh, here say, we go. <laughs> I was like, when's he going to come in with that? <laughs> when, when, when first? So we got to say go Hawks and great, great job to the owner of the Seahawks for being, being involved with this. And I think the other part that's cool for the listeners to know too, is that this is not Popovich's like first, like first rodeo using crowdsourcing and gamification. He led the team that did uh, fold it. So they did, um, they were looking at protein folding, but using the same type of mechanics where human intuition, 
was is certainly at first and, and crowdsourced human intuition. So lots of people doing it in parallel are really good at these little little things that maybe a machine can't learn quite yet without having really good data, without having like ground truth data. So this mechanism, this mosaic, gets this fantastic data set prepared so that it's going to feed this machine, uh, this machine learning algorithm, and then lo and behold, what they're going to get out of this is a brand new way to look at uh, like you know brain neuron imagery to predict a whole host of, or ho hopefully pre prevent a whole host of you know brain elements. I mean, they go into it a little bit there, but uh, Will or Nick, did they discuss like potential uses of this down the road? I know um, mapping out the brain for uh, to help out with Alzheimer's research is one of the areas that was mentioned in the article. Um, and just, you know, there's so many neurons in the brain, mapping them out is such a challenge. Uh, just to give an idea of the effectiveness of what Mozak has done so far, um, the Allen Institute's uh, analysts were doing about two and a third uh, reconstructions a week. After they launched this game, that jumped to eight and a third. So wow. they had an almost 4x. Wow. Um, increase in productivity and that doesn't meant sorry, does it mention um how, how they're getting these people uh participating is it something that you have to be invited to or can anyone do it anyone can do it i was actually about to plug it so oh. i just looked at the website so thank you uh, yeah uh, mozak.science huh nice very cool i've never i've never seen the dot science um you know uh <laughs> yeah domain or you know, landing yeah. space but yeah that's that's something. And I guess so yeah, mozak.science slash landing. You can play right there uh, in your browser. Very and cool. I guess just to explain it a little bit further for, for people, is so they're getting these people together. They're showing an image of a neuron, which is a, it's a complicated image because, you know, there's a, a core center and then there's like little, uh, they look like nerve endings or something that's, that's spidering out from it. And, and they just trace the spider like legs. Is that what? the game's all about yeah basically so yeah yeah so um it looks like a spider i think mean, that's probably the best way to describe it and there's all these images you know they're 2d images uh but it's a 3d mm -hmm. uh you know a neuron is three-dimensional so what they're trying to do is figure out you know which way each uh, individual thread or leg is going um the algorithms see overlap when they kind of cross over they can't tell which one is which uh, but the human eye can pick it out pretty easily so that's why they're uh, they're pulling in the help of all these different people and then aggregating the results to get a, a full comprehensive 3D model of that neuron. Wow, Very that's cool. amazing. Very cool, yeah. And it's and there's we see so many cool examples of um, of this kind of human feedback or like human data driven crowdsourced data that then goes into a machine and uh, algorithm teaches it better, teaches it much faster, and you get this really cool loop. This kind of a uh, this what do you call that like a flywheel effect going on and um without without this data set it would just it would probably take so much longer to to, to train this algorithm so this is a uh, this is cool stuff man very inspiring good find there will i think that when i actually went to clinton he was just fishing for a compliment <laughs> <laughs> so i you think I, I set myself up for it's possible i've done that before yeah self high five <laughs> nice job clinton all right uh, so that wraps us up for episode four of Lad About Crowdsourcing. If you have any feedback, uh, you want to get in touch with us, we are all on social media. You can find me on Twitter at Will underscore Price. And you can find me, this is Clinton, at Clinton Bond. So at C-L-I-N-T-O-N-B-O-N on Twitter as well. And me, at Hokey Nick. Nice. All right. If you want to uh, help us out, you could go ahead and subscribe and rate the podcast. Uh, if you're enjoying what you're hearing, we'd love to know. If there's other stuff you'd like to hear or ways we can improve, we would also like to know. So please uh, subscribe and rate. You can find us at loudaboutcrowdsourcing.com. Uh, if you would like to crowdsource with TopCoder, you can sign up right there and we can reach out to you. Uh, if you don't want to or can't crowdsource with TopCoder, there are so many other great vendors out there. We encourage you to get out there and try it. So that wraps us up for this week. Thank you all for tuning in, and we'll catch you next time on Lad About Crowdsourcing. <laughs>